it was a handful of years ago, I had the opportunity to uh, host a, a mission team that was coming t uh, to do a mission trip. And so there was this, this group of um, uh, college students and young adults, and they were coming to help do a mission trip. And I was like at the host church, basically planning the trip and planning mission projects and different things. And anyways, as they, as they came and we were all excited, we had all this stuff planned. And one of the things that we were going to do was a, was a VBS and that was going to be in the evenings. Well, during the mornings, we just did some different outreach in different neighborhoods and particularly the neighborhood I lived in at the time, uh, there was a family right around the corner that had a whole bunch of kids and just to be honest, uh, the kids weren't always taken care of super well. And there was a bunch of, a big family, a lot of kids, and we got to know them just living in, in that neighborhood. We, we did a lot to try to love these kids and invest in them. Uh, we did a lot to just try to love the parents. Well, anyways, we, that morning uh, before the VBS, we were doing some stuff in our neighborhood and the kids came out and they were running around and they were helping and they were having a good time. And we got permission from the parents uh, to, to pick up the kids and take them to VBS. And then we ended up getting a few other kids in the neighborhood. And so we had this whole kind of, you know, van load of, of kids that were going to come to our VBS that night. And uh, because there were so many, we were like, we need a big vehicle. And so the mission team, they had brought a van. And so I was like, hey, can, can you guys take your van and go pick up all the kids in the neighborhood, bring them to VBS. And that was the plan. Well, we got to VBS that night. We're getting set up. We're ready to go. And I was like, hey, it's time to go pick up the kids. We go get the kids. And I'll never forget the, the team leader. He looked at me and he said, uh, he's like, well, some of the people in our group uh, noticed that one of the kids or a couple of the kids uh, might have had light, like head lice. And they were like, and I don't know if we're really comfortable having them in our van. And I just remember, like, I was looking at him, and I was just, like, mad instantly. Like, I just wanted to be like, then what are you doing here? Just leave. You know, but I was like, don't worry about it. I'll go get the kids. <clears throat> and so I took uh, the truck I was driving at the time, and I think we had, like, eight people in a five-seater truck. But we got the kids to VBS. But um, I'll never forget that because I was, just, I was just so angry at the time. Because here's this team who, who seems like they're mature in their faith. You know, they, they took time out of their lives to come and serve people in need. Yet at the same time, they were completely uncomfortable being around the very people they came to serve. And I was like, and it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be that way. And that's what James is going to talk, talk about in chapter 2. Uh, we're going to study this morning. And here's, here's the main idea. If you want just the main point of the message is this, is that true love, or sorry, true faith always expresses itself through love. And if there's true, genuine faith in your life, the natural result of that is going to be love towards others. And James is going to kind of track that theme throughout the book and, and give different examples of what that looks like. But essentially what he's communicating through the book is that if we have genuine faith in God, it will result in genuine changed, genuinely changed lives. Like if we have been forgiven of our sins, if we've received the gift of eternal life, if we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, then our lives will, will should and will look different. And one of those main differences is going to be how, how we love one another, the way we treat one another. And so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to break chapter two down into two parts, first half and second half. And we're going to um, kind of talk about the main themes in each of those, each of those halves. So we're going to read the first half together. Part one, starting in verse, uh, starting in James chapter two, verse one through 13 is what we're going to read together. And then we'll break down that first half. It says this, it says, my brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, then you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. 
mercy triumphs over judgment. And so here's the big idea from this first half. His big point is he's saying you must not show favoritism towards different groups of people. He uses this example. He says, imagine that a rich man comes into your gathering and he's got nice clothes, he's got a gold ring, and then there's a poor man that comes in and he's, you know, maybe smells a little bit, he's got, he got filthy clothes. And he says, imagine you go and you greet the rich man and you offer him the best seat, you honor him, you do whatever you can to take care of him, but then the poor man you just kind of ignore and you just let him sit wherever's left. James says, uh, you have become a judge with evil thoughts if you treat them differently. And so let's, let's, ima- let's reimagine this in, in our day. Imagine we're here at church on Sunday morning and this very influential family in town co- comes to church, walks in the door. And they're wealthy, um, they've, got, they've got power, they've got influence, people look up to them, people respect them. You know what, tip, what a lot of times happens in a lot of churches? People, people in leadership go, oh, oh. We, we need to get that church plugged in. Like, we need to get them involved because, number one, like, they've got money. They can help uh, fund some ministry that we want to do. Uh, they've got influence, so people look up to them. They're going to help bring in new people. And, like, and so people, you just go out of your way to make sure they have an amazing experience so that they want to come back. Like, we want to get them plugged in. And James asks, hey, it's not wrong to do that. Like, there's nothing wrong with, with showing that kind of hospitality. But what James wants to know is he says, do you show that same kind of intentionality and hospitality to the single mom that comes in or the large family with, with a lot of needs or, or even, even a homeless person that, that wanders in? Do we show that same kind of intentionality, that same kind of hospitality, that same kind of attention to both? And James says, and if, if you don't, if your treatment of those two types of group is different, he says, you have sinned you've become a judge and you have, you're full of evil thoughts. You've broken the royal law, which is what he says. He says, you've, you've broken the royal law. If you do that and you go, what's the royal law? He tells us it's, it's love your neighbor as yourself, which Jesus says is the second greatest commandment. First greatest commandment is to love God. And he says, the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And and James says, if you, if your treatment of those two types of people is different, you've broken the royal law. Because if, if we're trying to keep this command to love our neighbors as ourselves, it means that we must love everyone, not just the people that are easy to love, not the people that look like us, not the people that act like us. He says, um, but if we're to keep this command, it means we love every person. See, Jesus shows us um, that loving our neighbor means loving every person we encounter, not just the people that we like or not just the people that are easy to love. It means loving everyone, especially the ones who are different from us, especially the ones who are hard to love. See, this type of of preferential treatment, it's pretty common in the world, right? Like it wouldn't be unexpected to see two groups of people be treated differently in the world. That's kind of normal. But what James is telling us is that that, that's, that's not how it should be in the church, that that's not the way that God works. See, we often think that God, um, God wants to use like the wealthy and the powerful and the people with a lot of influence. Like, man, those are the prime people. That's, that's who God wants to get a hold of and use them. And God actually says that he kind of does the opposite, right? He said in verse five, he says, listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith, right? Isn't God choosing the people that you wouldn't expect the outcast, the different, is he choosing them and giving them this, this great faith? Because, um, and then he, he talks, he says, uh, to inherit the kingdom promised to those who love him, which is a, a reference to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter five. Jesus says in uh, Matthew five, three, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. Paul says something very similar, kind of break, spells it out a little bit more in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 29. He says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God, cha- God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. And so scripture paints this picture that um, God chooses the unexpected, the outcast, like 
And so if we treat those people less, like what, what are we doing? Those are the people God, God wants to go after. Those are the people that God wants to use because he doesn't want anybody to stand before men and say, hey, look at, look at what I did. Look at what I did. Look at all this amazing uh, talent I have that I could use. No, God wants people to stand before him, broken people that somehow God used to do these magnificent things and they can stand there and be like, I don't know how in the world that happened. Only, only God. God can only do that. That's, that's what God desires. I love this quote that I think sums it up so well. It's a quote by Philip Yancey, and he says this. It's kind of a longer quote, but it's really good. It says, Jesus was the first world leader to inaugurate a kingdom with a heroic role for losers. What good news, right? He uses losers. Uh, He says, he spoke to an audience raised on stories of wealthy patriarchs, strong kings, and victorious heroes, and much to their surprise, he honored instead people who have little value in the visible world, the poor and the meek, the persecuted and those who mourn, social, social rejects, the hungry and thirsty. His stories consistently featured the wrong people as the heroes, like the prodigal son, not the responsible son, the good Samaritan, not the good Jew, Lazarus and not the rich man, the tax collector, not the Pharisee. As Charles Spurgeon expressed it, His glory was that he laid aside his glory, and the glory of the church is whenever she lays aside her respectability and her dignity and counts it to be her glory to gather together the outcasts. See, God loves to bring together the outcasts, the broken, people that you wouldn't expect. And James argues here, he says, if if that's what we believe to be true, if that's what God's word says, and that's, what, that's the, um, what God does. That's the way he works. He says, then if that's what we believe, then why do we treat each other that way whenever we get together? Why don't we treat people in need with the same respect and honor and attention that we give to the people who have a lot? And you know what? I, to be honest with you, it, it took me a while to learn this too. You know, I, earlier in the I started this story with, you know, saying, look at this mission team, and they, they couldn't figure it out, and I was the hero. But that, that's, that's actually, <clears throat> it's not completely true, because I had to learn this myself. Whenever I was uh, in college and first getting started in ministry, and I was, I was helping Kevin with youth ministry, and I remember showing up to youth on Wednesday nights, and uh, there for a while, it seemed like all of the, in a nice way, I guess the nicest way to say it is all the, the weird kids in our youth group, they like would flock to me. And I would show up on Wednesday nights and I'd be excited to hang out with all these teenagers. And then I'd just have these two or three, like the guys that were just really hard to get along with, the, the ones that everyone else got annoyed with. It's like they wouldn't, they wouldn't leave my side and I just had to deal with them all night. And I remember like at one point in time getting really almost frustrated about it because I'm like trying to connect with these people, but I, I just have these, these couple of kids that wouldn't leave me alone. And I, I, I prayed, I prayed this to God. This is I said, God, um, would you, like, help these kids to not be a distraction from my ministry? Like, would you, like, give me a break from them so that I can focus on ministry? (laughs) A distraction from ministry, right? And I I just remember in that moment, like, praying that, and then it was like, over time, it was like God just made this crystal clear to me. And I didn't hear an audible voice or anything, but God gave me this overwhelming sense where he's like, these kids are not a distraction from your ministry. They are your ministry. Like these are the people I've, I've put in your life for you to love and care for and minister to. And then all of a sudden it was like, I'm an idiot. Uh, but I realized like, no, these, these are the students who need love the most. I'm not gonna try to get rid of them to focus on, no, I'm gonna give them my full time and attention and love them. And I remember I got, one of them in particular, I got the opportunity to just go pick him up every week from his house because he didn't always have a ride. I went and picked him up every week and we hung out in the car ride and we talked and we talked about life. And you know, and half the time around youth, he'd follow me around, but it was okay because I, there was an opportunity for me to love and invest in him. And uh, that's, what, that's what James is talking about, that these these people who don't always have a lot, they're just as worthy of our time and attention as, as anyone else. And often they're the ones that, that need that ministry more. We're called to love them just the same. And so it may be normal to show favoritism in the world, um, but James says we don't get to do that in the church. We, we love everyone that walks in the doors. And he ends this whole section with a, with a warning to us. I want to reread the, the last two verses of that, verse 12 and 13. 
He says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And so you go, what is he saying here? What's this mean? He's showing us that uh, we, for those of you who have put your faith in Christ, who've been forgiven of your sin, you have been shown mercy. Like we have not been judged based on our sin. And so he says, treat others as if you've been shown mercy. If you've been forgiven of your sin, if you've not been treated according to the, the things that you've done wrong, he says, how could you not show that to others? And he actually gives a warning saying, hey, if, if you don't show that kind of mercy to others, then that kind of mercy won't be shown to you. And I think really what he's getting at, really what he means is that, um, that if we have the love of Christ in us, if we've been shown mercy, then we will naturally want to extend that to others. But if we, have it, if we don't extend that kind of mercy, it's, it's evidence that maybe we haven't really experienced it. It's evidence that maybe the love of Christ isn't really in us because if it's in us, it will naturally flow out of us to others. And so, uh, again, I want to kind of come back to that main point that true faith always expresses itself through love, right? If we have faith, if we have Christ in us, then it will be expressed through love. And what James is going to really jump into here in this second half is he's going to make the argument that if that love is not present in us, then perhaps faith is not either because faith will always express itself through love. So let's read the second half together, starting in verse uh, 14, and we're going to read all the way through the end. It says, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about this physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. And so the main point here in this second half is this, this statement that faith without deeds or faith without works is dead. And he uses this, this argument. He says, what good is it if someone claims to have faith, but they don't have any deeds to match it? He says, it's like if someone sees a person in need and wishes them well. Like you see someone in need and you're like, hey, hope hope everything goes well, hope you get everything taken care of. And he said, but you don't, but you don't do anything to actually help them? He said, would, like, if you saw that, would you consider that person loving if they're like, hey, I know you got a bunch of needs, but, you know, hope, hope it's all right, and you don't do anything? Would you consider that loving? No, that's not loving. That's, that's just fake, right? And so James is saying, hey, in the same way, like, if, there's, if you say that you have faith and you say that you have these desires, but there's no works attached to it, he's like, it's, it's dead, it's like it doesn't exist. And you go, what does that statement really mean? Faith without works is dead. Because a lot of times people get hung up on that. And um, there's kind of this debate of like, does this contradict other scriptures that say that, uh, you know, we're not saved by works, but we're saved by faith. But then James saying, hey, we're justified by works. Like, what does that really mean? What does it mean that faith without works is dead? And so uh, I want to start by explaining what it doesn't mean. And then we'll get to what it does mean. So what it doesn't mean, it does not mean that we are saved by our good works. The Bible makes it very clear that we're not saved by works. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So this verse makes it very clear. Hey, you're not saved by works. You're saved by faith alone. 
And Galatians 2.6 says uh, kind of the same thing, breaks it down a little differently. Galatians 2.6 says, we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So these verses make it crystal clear, like we're not saved by um, by works, that we are justified by faith alone, meaning we receive salvation and the forgiveness of our sins through faith alone in Jesus Christ. However, what James wants to add to that is to say that, uh, yes, we're, we're justified by faith, but then James argues that if faith is there, then it will result in good works, that genuine faith will result in good works. Uh, uh, maybe a, a better way to say it is salvation does not require good works. Salvation produces good works. That faith, faith, is, faith is the means of our salvation, but good works is the result of our salvation. It's the evidence that faith is actually there. Oh, oh don't need that anymore. Uh, the thought of this example is uh, as I've grown into adulthood, you, I guess you get a new adult hobbies maybe. Um, and so uh, pl plants, I started doing plants a few years ago, like growing plants at home. And uh, I, got, I got decently good at it, I guess, and I wasn't killing everything, and I have a bunch of house plants now. But earlier this year, I was like, specifically, I was like, I wanna try to grow some like herbs in our, in our house to use for cooking. And so I, I got two to start with, and I got a cilantro plant and a mint plant. I actually didn't get a plant, I got seeds. Um, so I got these two pots, and I put some cilantro seeds in one and, and mint seeds in the other. Well, uh, sh I followed the instructions, did everything it said to do, and then after a little while, um, some cilantro started growing, and I was like, this is great. But then the, the mint, no nothing, like no sprout, nothing came from it. And so I was like, okay, well, maybe I'll try this again. And so I put some more mint seeds on there, did the whole thing, followed the instructions, and sure enough, no, no mint, no nothing happened. And somebody after last service, they were like, do you want to know why the mint, cr the mint plant didn't grow? He was like, it wasn't meant to be. And I was like, that was a bad joke. <laughs> Uh, I laughed very hard when he told me that, but I got, so here, here's the thing. One of them, I put seeds in both. One of them took root and grew. The other one didn't. How do you know which one took root? Well, it's very obvious by there's a plant, there's fruit. And I think that's what James is saying is that if there's no works that accompany, well, then that's like proof that maybe the faith wasn't really there to begin with. Because if, 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 the, if faith took root in our heart, it will grow to a plant. It will, it will produce fruit. It will, it will lead to good works. Now, how dumb would it be if I showed up here with my mint plant and I was like, hey, check out this mint. I was actually going to bring them, but here's the problem. The cilantro did good for a little while and then it died too. And so I actually didn't have either to bring I was going to bring them, but I was like, there's no, there's no plant. Anyways, uh, but how dumb would it be if I like had this mint plant and I was like, hey, check out my mint plant. Like, look at this amazing mint plant. You'd be like, bro, that plant is dead. Like, there's nothing there. And it's the same way when it comes to our relationship with Christ. Like, if there's no fruit in our lives, if there's no good works that accompany it, then you'd be like, then the, the faith it didn't exist to begin with. Because what, it, what is it? Faith always produces, always expresses itself in love and good works. James says we show our faith by our deeds. And he uses this example of Abraham, and he says that his faith and his actions were working together. It, it said about Abraham that um, because of his faith, it was credited to him as righteousness, meaning he was made righteous by his faith. But how do we know that he had faith? Because he obeyed God. He did what God said. And he uses this example of Abraham and Isaac. If you're not familiar with the story, here's what happens. Basically, God blesses Abraham with this son, Isaac, and he tells him, hey, through this son, Isaac, I'm going to bring a great nation. And then, and so Abraham's like, sweet, my son's going to have this great nation. Like, I better take good care of him. And then all of a sudden, God's like, well, actually, actually, I want, what I want you to do is to sacrifice your son. And then Abraham's like, well, that, those, two things, those two things don't go together. You want me to sacrifice my son, but you're also going to bring a great nation? That doesn't make a lot of sense. So in that moment, Abraham had to have faith. Well, how do we know that he had faith? Because he did exactly what God said. He took his son Isaac, and he went to start preparing the sacrifice. Now, here's what Abraham didn't do. He didn't go, okay, God, theoretically, 
I believe that you have a good plan, but that sounds crazy, so I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. But theoretically, I still believe that you have a good plan. No, he, he obeyed. And he, he didn't say, hey God, um, theoretically, hypothetically, I believe that you could even raise my son from the dead if I sacrificed him, but we don't need to test that out. I'm just, I'm just gonna keep him safe. He didn't do that, Abraham. He trusted God. He trusted what God said, and he took action. He took his son Isaac, and he started heading up the mountain. And he, he demonstrated his faith by his, his action. He showed his faith. And, and it ended up just being a test, and God didn't have him do that to his son, but it, it was an opportunity for him to, to show that he had faith, that he trusted God's plan, that he had fully given control of his life to God, and he was willing to, to do whatever God said. See, I think what a lot of times has happened um, for many people is that we have equated intellectual belief with faith, and those are not the same thing. See, we can believe in God. We can be like, hey, I believe in God. I believe the Bible is true. I even believe that Jesus was a real person and that he died on the cross. And you know what James would say? Hey, man, that's great. But even the demons believe that. Even the demons believe that God is real and they shudder about it, but that doesn't mean they've given their faith to him. That doesn't mean they put their trust in him. Other people would be like, hey, I believe that all people are created equal. I believe that God loves all people, but these people kind of make me uncomfortable, so I'm going to avoid them. You know, we may believe that, but if we're not showing it, then, then what's it matter? Other people say, hey, I believe that God has a better plan for my life. I believe that I can trust him, but I'm just not really willing to let go of fill in the blank. He says, yeah, you may believe it in your head, but if it's not expressed in your actions, it's not true faith. And so what, what, what is the difference between f- belief and faith? I want to, I want to do this example uh, to kind of wrap things up this morning. What is the difference between belief and faith? Here's a chair or a stool. What if I said to you, hey, um, or if maybe you said to me, hey, you should take a seat in that stool. Here's, here's what belief looks like. That, I think this stool would hold me up. I mean, it's got, it seems the screws are all tied. It's got four legs. It seems sturdy. And you're like, yeah, take a seat in it. And I'm like, yeah, I believe. I believe that that chair will support me. I believe it could do that. Okay, we'll take a seat in it. You, you know, I think, I think it would do it. I think it would hold me up. That's what belief looks like. You know what faith looks like? You sit in the chair. It's not just something you believe in your head. It's, it's expressed through your actions. How crazy would it be if that thing fell as soon as I sat on it? That, it's a little, that would have been bad. It would have been great, though, at the same time. <laughs> See, beliefs, beliefs here, but faith requires action. And he's saying the, uh, his whole point here is that if, faith, if we have true faith in Christ, it will express itself through our actions. It will be expressed in the way that we love. And so I want to this time move into a time of response. I want to talk to two different groups of people. Um, there may be people here in the room who believe in God, like you, you believe that God's real, you believe the Bible's true, you believe that uh, Jesus died on the cross for you, but there's no, there's no fruit. There's no, there's no works that accompany it. Yeah, you believe it here, but you don't really have faith. My encouragement to you this morning is to, to, to sit in the chair. Don't just believe that God is good. Don't just believe that he is real or that his word is true, put your faith in him. Give him your life. Give him control of your life. Put your faith and trust in him completely. Because here's what happens when you do. Here's what happens when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It's not just belief. Here's what happens. When you do, when you repent of your sin, turn from your old ways and trust in him for salvation, here's what the Bible says. It says he will make you a new creation. He will forgive you of your sin, meaning that you will no longer be judged based on any of the things you've done in your past. You'll no longer be judged according to your sin. Instead, you will be judged according to the righteousness of Christ, meaning that when God looks at you, he's not going to see all the sin and all the terrible things you've done. He's going to see the perfection of Christ covering you. And you will no longer be judged based on your sin, but you will be, 
have mercy and grace poured out upon you. And not only will he forgive you of your sin, the Bible says that he will make you a new creation. He will transform you from the inside out, meaning that he will put his spirit inside of you and begin to transform your thoughts, giving you new thoughts, new desires. He'll make you more and more like Christ each and every day, giving you a new kind of love for people to where you, you don't think like you used to. You don't think about the things you used to. You don't care about the things you used to. Instead, you care about what God cares about. And he begins to use you to love and impact others. See, that's what happens when we get faith, true faith in God in our hearts is that we become more like Christ and it expresses itself through love. And so that's the first group of people. If you're here this morning and you're like, man, I believe, but I'm still hanging on, I'm going to tell you, just encourage you to sit, sit in the chair, put your faith in him. Second group of people, there may be others in here that uh, you have faith and it's shown itself in good works. Um, but maybe there's still some inconsistencies between what you believe and how you live. I like to think you're, you're kind of like the struggling cilantro plant. Like you, you're there, but, you know, could use some water, could use some, some encouragement. Let me ask you, is there, is, there, is there things in your life that are inconsistent? Are there inconsistencies between what you, what you believe and how you live? Maybe it's in the way, that you, the way that you treat other people or even in the way you ignore other people. It could be in the way that you speak, in the way that you talk to people, in the words that come out of your mouth. Are there inconsistencies um, in the way that you trust God and trust His plan for your life? Are there inconsistencies in the way that you pursue ungodly things or pursue worldly things or put your hope in things that, that, don't, that don't last. I want to encourage you this morning to allow God to convict you of, of those inconsistencies and show you where they are. And here's my encouragement to you. How do we move forward past those inconsistencies? Let me tell you, the, the solution is not just like trying harder. It's not like, man, I just need to get my act together and figure it out. I got to stop doing this. No, let me tell you, here's, here, let the gospel be the fuel that drives us to love and good deeds. And so if you're here this morning and that's you, my encouragement to you is to remember what God has done for you. Remember the mercy and the grace that he's poured out on your life. Remember the love and compassion that he has for you and let that be the fuel that drives you towards love and obedience. Let that be the thing that moves you to want to extend that same grace and love and compassion to others. You know, the, the people who are the most loving people, it's not because they wake up every morning being like, I need to try harder, I need to do better. The people who are the most loving people are the people that have the love of God so deep down in them that it just naturally flows out into other people. I didn't put this in, in my notes. It just, I couldn't get it out of my head this morning. Um, but many of you know the, Bar the Barnes family and Amy and I, at her funeral a couple days ago, the thing that was just overwhelming about her was that she just loved people, like she cared for people. And, and I, I just remember for me, like, um, I didn't have a ton of interaction with her, but she always loved my son because she loved rocking the babies. And she would always come by and always greet him and be excited to see him. And there's just this love that came out of her. Let me tell you why. It wasn't because she woke up being like, <clears throat> I need to get my act together. I need to love people better. No, she had the love. It came from the faith that was within her. That faith drove her to action. The love of God was so deep in her that it expressed itself through love towards other people. And so the more we get his love in us, the more it will flow out of us. And so that's, that's how we are, are moved towards love and good deeds. So at this time, I want to ask the band to come up. And I just want to ask you to take a moment um, just to reflect on where, where are you at in this? Maybe there's some people in the room that hey, today's the day like you need to sit in the chair. Today's the day you need to move from belief about God to, to true, genuine faith. Put your faith and trust in him. Give your life to him. Let me tell you, if that's you here in a moment, as the band plays, Kevin and I are gonna be in the back of the room and I wanna encourage you, come, come to the back of the room and say, hey, today I, I wanna give my life to Christ. And we would love to talk with you about that and pray with you and give you um, just some next steps, talk about what that means. There may be others in the room that, um, like I said, you just, there's some inconsistencies. And as we, as we pray, as the band plays, I want to ask you to just a, take a moment to allow God to convict you and show you what, what are those things in my life? What are those inconsistencies? And then remember 
what Christ has done. Let that be the fuel. And so use this time just to allow God to speak to you and show you how you need to respond. And so if you would at this time, bow your heads. I'm going to pray, and then you respond however you need to.